Welcome everyone to our first panel discussion of the CEPR Economic Summit. We're, we're going to get things started with an issue that's been very much on everyone's minds lately, the challenges that have been facing the global supply chain. For months, we've been hearing stories of ports that are backed up, shipping containers that are hard to come by, factories that can't keep up with demand, and the frustration all of that is causing consumers who are faced with the steepest inflation in decades. Paul Berger has been reporting on these issues for the Wall Street Journal during the pandemic, and his coverage has helped inform us of the ins and outs of the pandemic's in impact on supply chains. He's the perfect moderator for this panel, and he'll be leading a conversation among those who are dealing with both the big picture and the day-to-day -day struggles of producing and moving goods around the world. Paul has been with the Wall Street Journal for about five years, first covering transportation and then focusing on logistics and supply chain issues beginning in July of 2021. He's covered the Port Authority of New York and New Jersey, and was an investigative reporter for other publications, including the Jewish Daily Forward. He has a degree in Russian studies with a distinction in spoken Russian from the UCL School of Slavonic and East European Studies in London. I'm very grateful that Paul is with us today. With that, let me turn things over to him so he can introduce our panelists and get this conversation started. Thank you, Mark. It's, uh, it's a pleasure to be with you. Um, as, <coughs> sorry, I'm... Uh, Paul Berger, as Mark said, a logistics reporter at the Wall Street Journal. Usually I'm based in New York City, but today I'm joining you from Long Beach, California, where I've spent the past few days at the year's biggest shipping conference, talking to people from across the supply chain industry about the ongoing crisis. We have a large panel and a short amount of time to discuss one of the most complex issues affecting the nation today. I hope that by the end of this conversation, our audience will have a slightly better understanding of the causes of the supply chain crisis and why it will take a long time to fix. On our panel today, we have four people from very different parts of the supply chain. Ed Renwick is the Vice President of the Los Angeles Board of Harbor Commissioners, the body that oversees the Port of Los Angeles, and he's served on the board for almost a decade. Lior Ron, is the co-founder and head of Uber Freight, Uber's logistics business that has a digital network of over 1 million drivers across North America. Elaine Buckberg is the chief economist of General Motors. She's responsible for assessing the impact of worldwide economic developments on the company and on the auto industry. And finally, we have John Pocari. He serves as the port envoy to the Biden administration's Supply Chain Disruptions Task Force. He served in the Obama administration as Deputy Secretary and Chief Operating Officer of the Department of Transportation. And he served twice as Secretary of Transportation for the state of Maryland and as Chairman of the Maryland Port Commission. I'm going to save 15 minutes at the end of the session for audience questions. So please feel free to post them throughout the conversation so that I can turn to them later. But first, a brief recap. The COVID-19 pandemic began in the United States around March of 2020, triggering a wave of shutdowns. Imports plummeted, container shipping lines canceled services, and US businesses braced for a long recession. Instead, after just a few months, there was a swift rebound as those fortunate Americans who discovered they still had a job realized that they would be stuck in their homes for months. They bought office equipment and workout gear for themselves. They bought toys and tablets to entertain their kids. And as the months dragged on, some people realized that because they weren't paying for restaurants and vacations, they had money to spare. So they renovated their homes and bought new furniture. The result was an enormous surge of imports. At the nation's busiest port complex here in Southern California, imports last year were up 20% compared to 2019. That surge strained every link in the supply chain, causing bottlenecks at ports, rail facilities, truck yards, and warehouses. It led to massive shipping delays, and it sparked soaring import costs that helped inflation recently hit a 40-year high. If you wanted to ship a box from Asia to the ports here in Southern California in 2019, it would have cost you less than $2,000. Last year, shippers paid $20,000 or more for the same box on the same route. 
Ed, I'd like to start with you because you've had a front row seat to this at the Port of Los Angeles. Together with the Port of Long Beach, the port complex handles 40% of US imports. On any given day last year, there were dozens, if not 100 container ships waiting to unload at the ports. What do you think have been the biggest challenges for the Southern California ports in dealing with the cargo surge? Well, thank you very much. And I'm honored to be here. And that's a wonderful question. Um, that I've heard lots of lots of proposed causes for me, uh, and I think the metrics bear it out. They're pretty simple: um, insufficient warehouse space, both in the Inland Empire as well as in uh, places like Chicago. So we have gone weeks on end when you know every day at the port we make 34 trains of 300 cars and send them to Chicago. And there have been weeks on end when the railroads weren't transporting things to Chicago because Chicago was full. Um, similarly, in Southern California, um, warehouses are full. So what, what, what we've seen happen is that as, as the number of boxes we bring into the country increased by 20%, we were also selling the cargo in those boxes more via internet sales than via retail sales. And as and, and internet sales are more warehouse intensive. So as we've increased the need for more warehouses, you can't increase the space with a snap of a finger. And as a result, the warehouses have been unable to accept cargo and they were then leaving boxes on our yards, on our docks, for example, and making it harder uh, for us to bring ships in and, and move the stuff off. There was a time on average when um, the average box would stay on our docks for 11 days, 11 days. Uh, thanks to the work that uh, the ports have done with all of our stakeholders, and especially with uh, John Perkari and the, uh, the, the administration, we have now reduced that to, as of this morning, only five days, which is not, it's still not as, as smooth as normal, but um, normally we would keep boxes on the docks for about four days, but as of today, it's five days, which is certainly a lot better than 11. So okay. short answer, lack of warehouses. Got it. Um, let's turn from warehouses to trucks then. Leo, let's, let's turn to you. Uh, for people who aren't familiar with Uber Freight, your company matches truck owners with cargo loads that need to move across the country, mainly on medium and long haul truck routes. Could you talk about the main challenges that the trucking industry has faced during the pandemic? Uh, that's exactly right. Excited to uh, join uh, uh, my esteemed colleagues here and talk a bit about uh, truckers that in the end of the day need to move all of those goods. To, so to add the point, the ships come, they're short of warehouses, and then the reality of the past uh, 12, uh, 24 months is there's also uh, an acute shortage of drivers. Now, this is an industry that is already being under stress because the reality is truck drivers is just not, just not something that people want to do nowadays. People don't want to be away for 200 days a year from their family. People don't want to uh, run 30% empty unpaid. That's the average percent of empty miles those truckers are actually driving. And people don't want to be stuck uh, looking for parking um, and for uh, uh, truck stops. So the reality already pre-pandemic that we were facing a shortage or a lack of efficiency in the system. And with the pandemic, now you have a double whammy. One, drivers don't wanna go out on the road. They have their own health concerns. They wanna stay closer to the family. You see a massive drop of labor because of the pandemic. We published actually a study yesterday that shows a almost perfect correlation between Omnicon cases and raises of pricing for truckers in the market or labor, and that's because they're just staying home. Then couple that with um, more and more truckers are spending more time to add point, more of that sell is now e-commerce versus retail. So, so that's also a double whammy. One, uh, more truck drivers are doing a short haul in city professions versus staying on the road and doing those very long, grueling, empty miles. Two, you need more trucks because that's also not only more warehouse incentive, it's also more truck inten intensive because you need to move to from the uh, rail to uh, uh, the DC to the in uh, city DC. So you're doing more truck movements. So there's no drivers and then there's no trucks. 
because the chip uh, shortage, I'm sure Elaine is going to talk about it, there's also no trucks available. We've been a massive influx of truck orders, all-time high, 90,000 sort of orders for trucks, but there's no capacity. The OEMs cannot produce fast enough. And all of that, no drivers, no trucks, lead us to a, a, a crazy inflation on the price of moving goods. Uh, Ed gave, uh, uh, or you gave an example of uh, the cost of shipping a box. The cost of shipping a truck is now double than it, what it was pre-pandemic. Pre-pandemic, we were like around $2 per mile, the average rate um, of a truck movement in the US. Now it's $4 per mile, and that's sort of like driving inflationary cost across the ecosystem. So it's the quick prognosis on what's happening on the truck driving side. Thanks, Leo. Um, let's turn to Elaine then. Um, Elaine, you're, you're in a different position than our other panelists. Uh, GM's biggest problem last year uh, wasn't a labor shortage or even a congested freight network. It was a chip crisis. Can you explain how COVID-19 disrupted uh, GM and other auto manufacturers? Well, for us, the, the chip shortage has been the biggest issue. Due to the impact of chips on production, U.S. auto sales totaled about 15.4 million in 2021. That's down 2 million versus 17.5 in 2018-19, if you want to benchmark, but not due to lack of demand. Auto demand has been extremely strong through the pandemic. And in fact, sales were running at a 17.4 million seasonally adjusted rate in the first half of the year. They actually hit 18.8, which is just an extraordinary high level in May after stimulus checks and tax refunds um, and vaccination. And then they fell to 13.5 million uh, in the second half as the chip shortage led to heavy production cuts, especially due to problems from the Delta wave in Southeast Asia. Now, first of all, to give you a sense of magnitude, the chip shortage has and its impact on auto has really impacted the U.S. economy. So in the third quarter, when the chip shortage was at its worst in terms of its uh, plant downtime, auto was the biggest drag on Q3 GDP. And then new and used vehicle prices have been our, one of the largest contributors to inflation. And so they, it accounted for 40% of core CPI inflation in last year, 12 months to December, 40%. That's, there was a 12% increase in new vehicle prices, a 38% increase in used vehicle prices. Um, and used vehicle prices have dr indeed risen much more than new vehicle prices so that the relative price of a used vehicle controlling for content and quality is 22% higher. So now here's the good news. We're seeing better flow of semiconductors through our supply chain, and we expect continued improvement over the course of the year. All For GM, all of our North American plants are operating on normal schedules with one sole exception that's actually not chip related. Uh, we're running weekend overtime in a bunch of plants, and we've added back shifts at, to North American plants. So a much more healthy outlook. And we see vehicle production up 25 to 30% this year versus last year. Industry-wide, North American production is more consistent with less downtime. And to give you a measure of that, since December, so for three months, automakers have announced cumulative North American production losses of 260,000. But that's in contrast to three over 350,000 announced in the one worst week last September. So sort of looking at what we're doing to improve long-term resilience, and GM is completely shifting our approach to buying chips from buying components from our suppliers that contain chips to directly managing all of our chip purchases and chip design for our vehicles. Okay, thanks, Elena. I'd like to come back to that issue in a, in a moment, but uh, first of all, I'd like to turn to, to John. John, we, we've heard from each of our panelists about uh, bottlenecks and breakdowns at different links in the supply chain. Uh, you were brought in by the Biden administration in August to coordinate an easing of, of port bottlenecks and to try to un untangle some of the supply chain challenges that Ed, Lior and Elaine have outlined. Could you talk a little about the major challenges that you faced? Sure, Paul, and uh, thanks for having me here uh, today. 
first, as you laid out in uh, uh, in the opening here, the pandemic laid bare what was an underlying reality, which is the the goods movement system as a system was straining in the best of times. It was showing its seams uh, in the best of times. And when you add uh, a 20 percent increase on top of that of goods movement, it simply couldn't cope. So uh, it, it wasn't a failure. It was a series of failures. And uh, at uh, pretty much every step of the good supply chain, uh, those issues showed up. And as as Ed pointed out, the lack of warehousing space and distribution space uh, was was and is uh, one of the drivers of that. But the spotlight was on the ports themselves. Um, you, you, we were at the point where in uh, the ports of Los Angeles and Long Beach and other ports around the country, uh, you couldn't unload ships on the regular schedule because there was nowhere to put the containers. Uh, you literally had frozen uh, docks uh, because of that lack of movement. Uh, you had uh, a class one railroad uh, from the San Pedro Bay complex to Illinois stopping shipments for five days uh, be because in Joliet, Illinois, you literally couldn't unload anymore. So the, the, uh, the, the strains and stresses in the system were at every part of it. And I think uh, what it shows more than anything else uh, is that this has been a very siloed goods movement chain. We have never, uh, as, uh, uh, as a series of private industry uh, groups uh, or the government, taken a systems approach to it. Uh, and that, uh, as we pivot from the short-term operational response to some of the longer-term, more structural changes, building some resiliency into the system, uh, by taking that uh, systems approach and, and looking at and uh, being able to anticipate ideally uh, what some of those issues are going to be. So there's work to be done throughout the entire supply chain. Uh, although the focus is on the ports, uh, you can't uh, actually improve throughput and fluidity without attacking every bit of that supply chain. And, and just to emphasize, John's points are absolutely right on. The, the, the industry itself, has uh if you look at the shipping lines for most of my nine years on the port of los angeles the shipping lines have lost money and so as a result they have pulled money out of investing in resiliency and focused solely on efficiency and the problem with resiliency is it's inefficient it means having ships sitting around collecting dust it means excess warehouse space excess trucks excess equipment, excess labor. And um, in an industry that's losing money, no one wants to invest in that. Suddenly and recently, the industry has become extraordinarily profitable. And so now there's a, a desire to invest in resiliency. And the challenge that guys like John have courageously faced is trying to get the industry to focus, and this is what we at the port try to focus on, try to get the industry to focus on resiliency when when they're when times aren't good because that's when it needs continued long-term investment and to pipe quickly on the john and ed if i may add there's also been to build on that infrastructure point there's been a lack of digital infrastructure investment as well to john's point and ed's point if you're a company operating at three four five percent margin the last thing you'll care about is making long lasting it and technical investment so here we are at an industry where the highest amount of faxes in any industry in the US is in the trucking industry. <clears throat> and literally there's no standards in exchanging the data between the different stakeholders. And there's just a huge waste of the system because to John's point, everybody's like trying to solve in the silo. Everything, everyone is under invested, nothing is connected. So the second the system is in un under any stress, there's also a huge digital divide and I think we all expect as consumers I want to have an appointment in a warehouse good luck you can't actually do any uh, um, digital appointment with anyone I want to have a, a digital bill of lading good luck it's actually moving still on paper and faxes in the truck stop so stuff like that has really sort of like pulled back on any ability to respond to that search when the search happened well let's just it, it, I, can I I, ahead, sorry, Paul. John, I just I just want to turn this back to you a second, because I think everyone's kind of touching on uh, this really important idea. And I, and I think it's been probably one of the greatest challenges that you've faced, which is that the, the systems approach like touches on the idea of, of collaboration. And, and I have to say that as someone who's been covering this now for, for months, 
what you see instead of collaboration is a lot of finger po pointing and a, and a lack of cooperation. Uh, and instead, what you find is that every stakeholder in the supply chain is blaming everybody else for what's going wrong. It can be the, you know, the ports blaming the warehouse and the shippers or the truckers blaming the marine terminals and the warehouses. So I was just wondering, John, like how, how do you fix a system in, in which everyone is working in their own self-interest? Uh, and also, how much leverage does the federal government even have when the industry is almost exclusively controlled by private companies? Yeah, Paul, as you correctly point out, it really is a private sector uh, endeavor, the entire goods movement uh, supply chain. And the first couple of weeks uh, as kind of a first responder on the job here uh, in listening to people throughout the the supply chain, there was a lot of finger pointing. Um, and uh, we quickly got to the point where uh, where we had to say, yes, but that may be true. But unless we, uh, it's kind of the tragedy of the commons, unless we're working together here, we are not going to actually sol solve this uh, collective problem individually. And uh, I think to everyone's credit, uh, in, in both one-on-one -on -one conversations uh, and in group activities working together in working groups, uh, people have tried to actually overcome uh, those silos and work beyond them. Um, it, it means in many cases, uh, going back to the C-suite uh, of these companies and making exactly the case that you just heard about, that in a what had been a very low margin industry throughout the entire goods movement chain, that you need to invest uh, in resiliency, in surge capacity, uh, and in um, uh, be basically better uh, throughput for the future. Uh, the good news in this uh, is that uh, uh, one, uh, both private and public funding is actually flowing here. And on the public side, with the bipartisan infrastructure law, ports alone have $17 billion of funding over the next five years. That's an order of magnitude more than uh, they've had in the past. Uh, and the emphasis tends to be on brick and mortar infrastructure, which is certainly needed throughout the entire goods movement chain. But, but uh, as Lior pointed out, the digital infrastructure, the information sharing part of it, uh, making sure even the existing technologies and systems are talking to each other uh, is the short term task. And uh, what you'll see uh, uh, from the administration on the federal side going forward very shortly is a voluntary pilot project, uh, a concept of operations to actually collaborate on data to everybody's benefit. And if you wanna participate in this, you have to bring your data to the table. So more on that shortly, but I want everyone to know that there's at least as much emphasis on the digital infrastructure, on, on the data sharing, uh, as there is on the brick and mortar part of it. Both are essential, uh, but we're at least recognizing now that we're, uh, decades behind in terms of, of uh, how we share information in, from silo to silo. Right. And obviously, that would be a, a huge improvement if if the data were better and data sharing were better. But you know, I think the other thing that the crisis has kind of laid bare is the fact that it is a supply chain, and and the chain is only as strong as its as its weakest link. And I, you know, I was just wondering actually when Leo mentioned earlier on about truckers and the difficulty of retaining truckers or hiring truckers, particularly for these medium and, and long haul jobs. And so I'm wondering, you know, you can improve as much as you like, but I just wonder today, you know, with uh, wages going up in, in warehouses and other places where however tough the work might be, at least you get to go home at the end of the night. I was just wondering for you, Leo, looking at your industry, um, how on earth are you going to attract people and retain them going forward when the realities of life on the road are so tough and when obviously fewer and fewer people want to do that job anymore? That is the trillion dollar or four trillion dollar global question. Uh, and it's a super hard challenge. I think there's no one silver bullet, but I'll mention some. Um, first, uh, to John's point, there's just so much inefficiency in the system that leads to driver churn. We can do better. Uh, we can help them get access. Uh, until a few years ago, this is an industry that is dominated by the small guys, the owner operator. Like more than 96% of trucking companies in the US have 10 trucks or less. So technology could be the greatest equalizer allowing those folks to have access to any shipment in the market, allowing them to actually run much more optimized versus 30% uh, 
empty to join's point once we can start connecting data once shippers open up once people recognize that if they move a load from point x to point y they shouldn't return empty but they can actually load another shipper and go back to the same point utilized then you start getting much more efficiency and the whole act of starting a tracking company getting demand getting your uh, uh, optimization doing business we can just simplify that uh, uh, so much uh, and just attract more people to profession so i think that's in a digital level then in the infrastructure level we just need to care for that profession more and i applaud sort of secretary budget just actually putting a plan today in place like actually caring for truck stops putting some spent in place motivating the ecosystem to invest in, in in basic infrastructure when you're a truck driver and you're looking for two hours a day on average in the end of your driving hour for a truck stop you're waiting for six hours on average a day to be loaded and unloaded because the pure inefficiency in warehouses and most of those warehouses probably wouldn't have even a toilet for you that that's not a profession you want to be part of so I think investing in physical infrastructure is the other thing uh, we can do. And finally, there's the question of pay. I do think there's a big opportunity even before payment optimization, I'll give you one stat. If we found 15 more minutes of time by optimizing a driver schedule every day, we will solve most of the shortage issue in the market, 15 minutes. But then on top of that, I think there's pay opportunity as well. Shippers are economic creatures, as we see inflation. As they care more to build resiliency, they will pay more. We see that in the market, and some of it is flowing to drivers. So I do think a, a, there's a silver of hope. A, we're living in a golden age now of owner operator. New registration to truck driving has basically doubled over the past 24 months. And we're seeing more and more and more people entering the profession now, the question is, can we invest fast enough to make sure this is not just sort of like a, a momentary search, but a secular and sort of an ongoing and sustainable search? And I, I think the points that we are making are so powerful. The, the lives of truck drivers. So at, at the Port of Los Angeles, we have about 18,000 truck drivers who come to us once a month, about 11,000 truck drivers who come to us every week. The average truck driver, they get paid per load, and the average pay per load works out to be about $60 per load. They make on average fifty-one dollars to $53,000 a year. That puts them well into the third quartile of income earners. It is a brutal life. Um, and the difference between them being able to feed their families and them not being able to feed their families is whether or not they get two trips or three trips per day. It's literally that's that's where their lives hang. And so it's not surprising in the state of California, there are 640,000 licensed truck drivers and only a quarter of them are making a living being truck drivers. You know, we, we and I hate how we phrase things. We always say there's a, a shortage of 80,000 truck drivers. There isn't. There's a shortage of people willing to pay truck drivers enough to get them to work. It's not that we have a shortage of truck drivers. And in general, in this entire um, congestion, the problem has never been labor. The problem is um, either a lack of compensation for labor or else a lack of infrastructure, physical infrastructure, which takes time to develop. Right. Thanks, Ed. Um, so we're, you know, we're, it's nearly 1.30. I'm going to turn to the Q&A in about 15 minutes. I, I don't see any uh, questions submitted so far. So if anyone is watching and they do have any comments or questions that they'd like to put to the panel, then uh, you know, please do uh, share them now. Um, uh, Elaine, I just wanted to turn back to you because you definitely <laughs> think you're the one with the most positive message out of everybody on here so far. But um, the journal published a story at the weekend that said that last month, 82% of new car buyers paid above sticker price for their vehicle. And as you already outlined, you know, vehicle prices are having an outsized impact on inflation. So when do you see prices starting to stabilize and, and what do you see as the biggest challenges going forward? First of all, the ratio of ATP or average transaction price to MSRP was about 101 last month. So about 1% over the manufacturer's suggested retail price. But to put that in context, it's normally about 85%. 
uh, retail price. And what we've seen is as production has gone do down, but demand has been extremely robust. And I'm happy to explain all the reasons for that robust demand because we really saw, uh, like for computers, pandemic induced demand for vehicles into that really robust demand, but lower production, we saw inventories fall off rapidly. So norm about 4 million level for the last six months, about 1.2 million. And as those inventories have dwindled and um, many on this, this Zoom have probably seen bare lots at dealers in their neighborhoods, uh, then prices have gone up. So dealers have been very effective at price discriminating. And we've seen prices go up for through two different channels. One would be that um, the incentives that automakers open, offer have tightened and have fallen substantially during this period. And dealers have raised what they charge over their own cost. And that's what driven up this ATP to MSRP. Now, as I said, the outlook for this year is better. And so if that proves to all be realized and it's still a dynamic situation, then we should see at least stabilization of inventory levels. And I think when we see that, when dealers are confident that uh, there's a steady flow of vehicles coming to their lots every month, even if they're not building up that inventory on their lots, um, we should see pricing at least stabilize. Um, and so I'm, I'm optimistic that we'll see that in the coming months barring uh, new one in, uh, unexpected challenges. And, you know, we've just had been full of them, obviously, in the recent, but I think the outlook's good in terms of chick production for better, better vehicle flow and uh, better inflow to those dealers and ultimately to customers. Thanks. And, uh, you know, in terms of these unexpected challenges, um, I assume you may be alluding there to, to Ukraine, and I'd, I'd like to turn to that uh, terrible situation now. I mean, I have a huge interest in, in that part of the world, having studied Russian and, and spent time in both countries, and I, I don't want to detract from the human tragedy that's unfolding there, um, but it, it would be remiss of us if we if we didn't talk about how the war and, and Russia's growing isolation might complicate efforts to fix the supply chain. So, um, Elaine, could you tell us how, how the war is affecting GM and other automakers? Well, let me speak for GM. So, first of all, our thoughts are with the people of Ukraine as well. Um, and the loss of life is obviously very tragic and our concerns for the safety of the people in the region. We have suspended our vehicle exports to Russia, uh, and we do operate a national sales company in Russia and CIS markets that's based on a portfolio that's sourced from North America and Korea. Um, and we're in constant contact with our team in Moscow, and we're taking appropriate steps to safeguard their personal safety, um, as well as that of our business. We no longer own or operate any manufacturing facilities in Russia. Um, and we have limited supply chain exposure, but we're working very closely with our supply base uh, down multiple layers to mitigate any potential risks. We're also committed to complying with the laws and regulations of the markets in which we do business, including the applicable U.S. economic sanctions and export control laws and regulations. And we're working in real time through the implications uh, for our operations of those evolving sanctions. Um, we're continuing to monitor developments and take actions to implement mitigation strategies as appropriate. Obviously, it's, it's the most important thing happening in the world right now. It's a great strategy and it's a fluid situation. Thanks, sorry, I forgot to unmute myself there. <laughs> Um, John, uh, you know, maybe you could talk about this a little bit more broadly in the last uh, what, few days. We've seen most of the major ocean carriers and, and freight forwarders say that they're going to stop, uh, you know, doing business at Russian ports and with shipments into and out of Russia and obviously also Ukraine. Can you talk a little bit about how this is affecting the supply chain? Sure, Paul. We're already starting to see some of the effects, and, and obviously, as Elaine said, this is uh, this is a tra uh, tragedy of immense proportion, and we shouldn't forget the human element of it. Uh, as as we're uh, looking at the impact on the global supply chain, uh, the sanctions themselves uh, will have a, a, a 
a limited effect on global container shipping uh, in the short term. Uh, as you pointed out, three of the largest uh, uh, steamship carriers, CMA, CGM, uh, Maersk, and MSC, uh, basically said they would not carry Russian uh, cargoes. Many others have followed. So uh, about 65% right now of the global container capacity is represented by carriers that uh, uh, have said unilaterally that they're not going to carry those cargoes. The sanctions do not apply, as you know, to uh, exports on um, crude, LNG, coal, uh, and other commodities, uh, at least uh, so far. Um, but, but we know that these sanctions uh, uh, will have an impact if, uh, if some of it is geographically specific. The Port of Rotterdam, for example, about 10% of the container movements are to and from uh, uh, Russia. Uh, those have obviously stopped. It will have some short-term stresses and impacts. Uh, and the kind of resiliency that we talked about a few minutes ago is absolutely essential uh, for, for this. It's one more illustration that whether it's a humanitarian disaster of the first order like this one, a natural disaster or some other economic upset, uh, that that uh, we need more resiliency in the system. We're starting to see some of the impacts now. Uh, this uh, for the United States directly, uh, Russia is a, is a fairly small global trading partner, um, but nevertheless, it it has uh, worldwide ripple effects. Thank you. Um, getting quite a few questions coming in, and I think I might turn to them a, a little early because there's a definitely a, a pattern here uh, emerging with questions about self-driving trucks. So I uh, wonder if we could just uh, go back to the, the supply chain issue and maybe Lior, you know, uh, when we were talking earlier on about uh, attracting and, and retaining drivers, um, are we going to see self-driving trucks in the next 10, 20 years? Is, is that maybe one of the solutions to the supply chain crisis? Yeah, great question. And I want to focus in my answer uh, before on what we can do for drivers. Uh, but uh, on self-driving, yes, we will see self-driving. Yes, it will be commercially deployed, but it will take time. And I think this is going to be a hybrid uh, future. So let me elaborate. Uh, I think from a capacity perspective and supply chain perspective, we need a self-driving technology, a much safer and allow us to actually do something from a safety perspective on the roads. B, especially for those longer hauls, we need more capacity. As we've just discussed, truck drivers do not necessarily naturally gravitate towards doing that, and there is room to fulfill those with self-driving. So then, from a technology perspective, it's about when can we actually have something that is safe and commercially deployable. I think the answer is uh, we will see the initial commercial deployment in the next two to three years. Those will be limited deployments, but they will be deployments with driver out of the seat in very limited sections, in very limited weather conditions, in very limited times of day, with very, so everything has to sort of like be right, traffic, uh, weather, uh, time of day, to actually uh, make that a commercial reality, but it will happen. We will see repeated commercial activity. Then the big question is, how much time would it take it to actually scale to make a dent on capacity and supply chain? And I, I don't want to predict because nobody actually knows. Uh, I think it's going to take a while because the degree of complexity then to make it continuously operating in a consistent way, in a way that you can actually rely on that, that's a very, very high bar. Uh, it will happen, but I think it's going to take a long time. If you think about what's going to be the model of the future, it's going to be a, once this is commercially scalable at scale, the model is going to be hybrid. We're going to see self-driving taking more and more of those long miles on highways, and then drivers, that, that's their natural preference to begin with, are doing more of those short local miles on the first sort of drop and the last drop. And essentially what a, a self-driving truck becomes then is sort of a railway on the highway. And it will have sort of next level implication for supply chain at large, such as changing distribution of uh, distribution centers, changing the location, changing what it means to haul goods, what is a day away means if you can operate 24 seven with a self-driving truck. 
But I think for those second level effect, we're looking at at least a decade, a decade plus to, uh, to play out. So I want to jump in here just to provide some um, support for the speed that Lior is talking about. In terms of technology development, you can go on YouTube and watch videos of uh, cruise automation vehicles, a company owned by GM, taking people on free rides around the city of San Francisco with no driver. So the technology is advancing, and obviously there are different issues with the size and weight of a of a full size cargo truck, but the technology is really advancing and and the incentives as Lior has laid out powerfully are are very strong for getting those technologies customized to those long haul freight runs. Thank you. And if I, if, if, oh, if I may, Paul, sorry. very quickly, yeah. it, it's not an either or situation, as Lior pointed out, it, it's a both uh, and it's an and plus where uh, the uh, self-driving class A trucks. Uh, it's moving forward very quickly. There's a framework for its adoption. You will see much more of it. In the meantime, right now, there's a lot that we can do for the uh, for the drivers that are out there. Um, the apprenticeship programs, for example, where uh, uh, drivers don't have to pay their own tuition, essentially, to get the commercial driver's license. Um, and employers are paying that, uh, in some cases, on a voluntary basis. Those are the kinds of things we need to, to do in the short term, while this medium and long term trend that I, I think both uh, Lior and Elaine accurately described is going forward. Thank you. And, uh, you know, the other questions, I mean, it's in a similar vein regarding automation at, uh, you know, U.S. ports are, uh, you know, famously uh, less automated than some of the other major foreign ports. Um, Ed, what's your take on, you know, how quickly, how soon we might see more automation at the port of Los Angeles or more broadly at U.S. ports? Uh, I, I think the case has not actually been made that automation is effective um, it, because um, so uh, the Port of LA and, uh, and Long Beach have two terminals that are, um, that, are, that are automated and they are not more productive than the other terminals. Um, there are certain advantages to automation and certain disadvantages to automation. But it's um, it's not that it, by no means is it clear that it's effective. Um, so I, I think that it, and the one thing we do know is that it's considerably less flexible. So uh, the Port of LA and Long Beach are unique among ports because we take a, a large ship will show up at the port and it will be emptied out almost completely, and then it will be filled up almost completely and sent on its way. Most ports are start and stop, start and stop. So if it's going to work anywhere, you would imagine it would be most effective in the ports of LA because it's sort of all one and then all the other. Um, as time changes and as trade routes change, as you see more uh, trade, north-south trade instead of east-west trade, for example, it's less likely that the port automation is going to be effective. It's going to be less flexible. So I, I think the jury's out on whether it's effective. Um. Maybe the case. I, I, I have I, I've heard that argument before, and I've also heard arguments, uh, you know, in favor of automation. And uh, you know, I think it's pretty pretty well known that the the labor union on the west coast um, doesn't particularly like automation on the east coast. It's kind of even worse. I was just wondering, maybe maybe John, you could maybe you've been involved in some but just, just conversation. To just to finish up, so uh, agreed, the labor unions really don't like automation. And in fairness, though, um, that fight in, in many respects has it's already been put into the union contracts. Um, so that it allows for automation. And another factor that's really leans towards automation is the fact that the cost of installing it has fallen considerably over time. So you could see a future, and I don't mean to say that there it won't happen. All my point only is the jury is out. John, could I ask what your experience has been with the automation discussion? 
Yeah, I think that uh, like a lot of other things um, in the goods movement chain right now, the focus, the spotlights on the port part of it, when the system is actually what we should be looking at. And uh, it's only as efficient uh, and throughput's only as good as the as the entire system. And uh, uh, you see the inland part, uh, whether it's rail, trucking, the, the middle mile, the distribution and fulfillment center are part of it are, are at least as uh, big a bottleneck on throughput. And I wanna make a plug here for uh, taking that systems approach as you're building a program of projects. We talked about bricks and mortar uh, infrastructure. Uh, well, how do you do that? Uh, one of the ways uh, is with the agreement that we've now signed with the state of California, where for the first time, the California State Transportation uh, Agency is building a program of projects inland. Uh, highway capacity, rail capacity, uh, ICTF terminals, uh, land acquisition, all of which are, are designed to eliminate specific bottlenecks and build capacity and resil uh, resiliency. That's where you get to uh, not just the fluidity, but the velocity that you want in a goods movement system. And so I'd urge people to take the broad view of the entire goods movement chain rather than have a spotlight on one specific element of it, because I think we're missing the point if, if we do it that way. Good points. Um, I have another really interesting uh, question here. Someone's asking like, when, when you guys see demand starting to slow down or whether you see it slowing down in the near future, um, the situation I think across the domestic supply chain is a little bit better now than it, than it was just a few months ago, but we're just coming off the back of the, the Lunar New Year, which is a traditional kind of lull in the, in the shipping season. Um, I don't know, maybe we could start with, with, uh, with you, Elaine, since, since you're watching this uh, from GM's perspective. Like, do you, do you have like a crystal ball about when we might start to see things improve? Well, let me just give a, a broad macroeconomic perspective. When the pandemic became, began, you know, and as you alluded to early on, Paul, people shift their, shifted their consumption from services to goods. And uh, as, you know, if we vaccination helped normalize things somewhat as demand for all the services people normally spend their money on from restaurants to salons to uh, hotels improved, but it's still heavily biased towards goods. And there's still, uh, you know, Omicron pulled demand back. Uh, overall in the economy, but especially for all those high contact services. If we get to a place of, of persistent normalization, and right, we've had big progress again with the CDC saying in most of the country, most people do not need to wear masks provided they don't have uh, existing health compromises, we could see more persistent shifting back to consumption of services and people would shift their budgets back away from goods. Indeed, they may have sort of stocked up their, their homes may be very freshened in many cases and so on, so that we would see a more persistent move away from goods in general. And that would reduce demand for goods import and help reduce that pressure on the entire supply chain. And if, if and when that happens, what would happen to prices? Like, would they merely stabilize or as shipping costs and other costs come down, should we expect prices to well, come down Well, first of all, too? prices for goods in the economy, I mean, inflation has gotten much broader base, but a lot of the uh, price increases in recent months are on things like, you know, not just autos, furniture and other things that have been uh, their supply has been constrained by this. So if we see normalization through some combination of drop on demand and catch up in the supply chain, in the freight supply chain side, um, then I think that we could see those prices either normalizing or actually coming off. Now, how do prices go come down? Well, it's things like more sales. Right. So there's lots of ways in which prices can actually drop over the course of the year. So that's a that's a, a source of downward pressure later in the year on inflation. And uh, if if I may add on our side to build on what Elaine uh, saying, so we're tracking, we serve about 15,000 shippers on one side of the marketplace. We talk with them all at all times on the inventory buildup, the demand they're seeing from consumers, and then we serve, uh, to your point, more than a million truck drivers on the other side. So we're trying to uh, stay pretty close to uh, the supply and demand signals. 
Uh, I would say on the demand side, uh, we're seeing some easement, but even, and we have the benefit of the Uber data, uh, even as rides and ridership go back, as cities open up post-pandemic, delivery and eats order don't necessarily actually go down. People are like now in the habit of consuming more from home. To Elaine's point, they might have like bought their pool and furniture, but like in terms of like consuming more from home, it is a thing, even post-pandemic, as uh, things open up. So there's less demand than the sort of height of the pandemic, but we still see relatively elevated demand. Uh, but I think the good news on the supply side, things are slowly but surely recovering. We just crossed for the first time over the past two years, 100% of truckload employment compared to pre-pandemic. Up until like last week, there was still less drivers in the market compared to two years ago. For the first time, we've crossed that. Truck driver ordering is now coming back to the market. The OEMs are recovering. We see some of that coming, entering the market again. Uh, there's been a surge of new trucking authorities. They're coming back to the market. So we see signs of easement. Truck rates have actually fell by 10% over the past two weeks, but we think H1 is still going to be uh, the first half of the year pretty tight. And then as supply continues to come to the market, some of the demand flows down. The second half is where I think we're going to see some easement. And again, I'm talking tracking, I think, to John and Ed points. It's a, very, it's a connected ecosystem. So across everything, it's going to take more time for the entire system to level up and sort of like load balance, probably into 2023. Uh, but we see good signs into the second half. Thank you. Uh, we have a question from somebody uh, who, who wants to know what the main reasons are for the increase in shipping costs from $2,000 to $20,000 plus. I'd um, kind of like to address that question, but in a, in a slightly different way, which is, again, you know, uh, Lior, Elaine, you know, you're talking about these these signs, right, that life is starting to return to normal, and yet... The conference I've just been at, I was talking to shippers and they've been signing their annual contracts, some of them this week. And, you know, when they used to pay two or three thousand dollars for that annual contract, you know, they were saying to me that the new normal for those contracts for this year is seven or eight thousand um, dollars, which, you know, is uh, enormously expensive for them and obviously serves to make the goods that we buy more expensive, too. So if those prices are locked in for this year and if we can expect that the, the, the short-term market, the spot market is going to remain high, um, obviously it's been the supply and demand issue as well as the congestion that's served to make those costs go up. Uh, I don't know who the best person is to talk about. This. Maybe it's John because you have the, the big overview of the entire chain. But you know, I think a big question in the industry is, it's kind of a cliche, but is this the new normal or will those shipping rates come down? Because once those underlying shipping rates come down, it helps to lower the cost of everything for the importers. Yeah, Paul, great question. And and I think to preface the question, uh, you do have to get to uh, what we were talking about previously, which is the volumes. Are they going to go down at all? I personally think throughout the supply chain uh, on, on a uh, an average basis that what you're seeing now is the floor, not the ceiling, that we're not likely to see substantial declines in volume. Um, and that's important in its likely impact on rates. And the the, the eye-popping numbers out there are, are definitely concerning. Um, and the most eye-popping ones uh, are the spot rates. It is a little harder to, uh, to have an accurate read on the private contracts, which uh, constitute the vast majority of the uh, of the volumes that are out there, um, but even for the largest cargo owners that uh, that, that uh, uh, have that kind of worldwide volume, they're clearly looking at increases. Um, and uh, this, uh, to some extent, has been a boom and bust industry in the past. Um, uh, but uh, even with new container ship capacity coming online, uh, even with um, uh, every vessel in the world that's uh, able to steam uh, out there working. Um, there hasn't been much relief on the rate side. So uh, it, it, it's, it's clearly, uh, uh, if rates do stabilize and lower, they're going to happen, I think, um, in stages, uh, not, not very quickly. And uh, the tell 
uh, is what the large cargo owners are uh, negotiating, um, much of which they're obviously, for competitive reasons, not going to share. I let a super quick insight that might be helpful here. The other thing, I think the uh, positive things that happen is supply chain used to be this thing in sort of the back office that nobody cared about, including shippers. In a world where we're all at home ordering much, many more goods and care much more about when will they show up, a supply chain investment becomes much more of a priority for those shippers. And the difference between I actually have the good that the consumer is looking for versus, oops, I don't because I haven't had the right contract is, is basically night and day in terms of customer acquisition and customer retention. So for a lot of those retailers, logistics investment is now part of marketing <laughs> because it actually allows them to attract and retain consumers, which explains some of the willingness to actually pay higher rates short term to ensure like an uninterrupted supply chain as well. And just to build off of those points, um, I, so, so I've been at the port now for nine years, and in over half my time there, the average spot rate was about eight hundred dollars per a container for the shipping lines to be break to be profitable. They really have to make more like fifteen hundred dollars per a container across the Pacific. And so, for much of my time at the port. The shipping lines were subsidizing, in effect, uh, the beneficial cargo owners. So, do I ever see us going back to those days? And I think the answer is no, not anytime soon. The one thing that we have learned is that shipping rates are uh, have a very steep price elasticity of demand, and so relatively small changes in volume can have a significant impact in reductions. Um, I definitely agree with the points that John were making is that you know demand is elevated. It's in in Lewis saying the same thing. It, demand is elevated. It's going to remain elevated for a long period of time. And with this kind of elevation, it's going to take three years to start. You know, the the, the keels that are being laid down now are going to take three years to build out that capacity. Um, but I will say the supply chain has been responding in a very aggressive way. So. When I started at the port, we had 20 major shipping lines that would come to the port of Los Angeles. That number dropped to nine because the industry was unprofitable. And so there was massive consolidation. In the last year, we've seen three new uh, shipping lines pop up. Um, the number of ships that have come to the port of Los Angeles, you know, we're servicing 20% more boxes, but we're servicing them on 50% more ships. The industry is pushing as many ships as humanly possible. And so, um, shipping rates will be elevated for a, a period of time. I absolutely agree. Um, but um, you know, it, it, it's, it's, not the, it's not the new normal, um, I think, for the long haul. Could I just very quickly ask, ask you, Ed, or maybe you, John, let's, let's start with you, Ed. Um, you know, I've been out uh, down to the ports quite a bit over the last few days here. There are still a lot of boxes on those terminals. Uh, the throughput has definitely increased. But as I said earlier, we are in this lull phase. Um, is there a danger that we are going to, you know, as things start to ramp back up, as importers look towards, you know, later in the year, is it? Is it possible we're going about, to start to see? What I'm worried about is the empties, not the full boxes. So um, it, at the at the peak, we had about 95,000 full boxes sitting on the, the LA terminals, um, almost 50. So that was 95,000 and almost 50,000 of them, a little over 50,000 of them had been there sitting for over nine days or more. Uh, by working with John and working with the industry, we've reduced that to pretty consistently. Half the number have been there, are, are there 50,000? And, you know, as of this morning at eight o'clock, we only had 11,000, a little bit more than 11,000 sitting on, uh, they've been there more than nine days. So that's been very successful. The hardest, the harder part to fix is the empty container sitting on the terminal. Uh, and what's what's happened is, is that as the number of small shipping lines come into existence, um, they bring boxes to the port, but they don't bring empties away. And that causes empties to stack up on the docks. Normally, the number of boxes that come to the port is the same number of boxes that leave the port. But with the, the advent of these new smaller shipping lines, remember the 50% more ships that we talked about, most of those are small ships. They're bringing a lot of boxes and they're not bringing any boxes back. When the empties stack up, it causes the truck drivers that Lore works with uh, lots and lots of problems because the truck drivers 
can't drop off a box and empty at the port. Um, and so, so the boxes you're seeing, I suspect, are empties, and they are very concerning. And we are doing a lot to try to keep them down. They were up as high as the mid 60,000s, and so we've we've had some success in pulling them down. But there's a lot of work left to do. I, I think we could disappear down a, a rabbit hole of talking about the empty container problem for at least the next 10, 15 minutes. But um, looking at the time here, I think that's about all we've got time for. So. Uh, I just want to say thank you uh, to all of our panelists, Ed, Lior, Elaine, and John for sharing their thoughts and experiences. I, I hope the audience has found this useful and I'll pass it back to Mark. Thanks so much, uh, Paul, and to all of you. That was really a great discussion. And uh, for me, the timing was really good because I'm in the midst right now of teaching Ecom 1 and we're just covering inflation. And next week we're doing international trade and for selfish reasons, I've been starting to try to buy a new car. So like I, I learned so much in this session, it was like, couldn't have been better for me. But um, I, I think it was a terrific discussion. So grateful to all five of you for making time. I know you're super busy nowadays and I'm incredibly, incredibly grateful you were able to join us and give us these insights. Uh, for those of you who are watching and are supporting CEPR as one of our associates or advisory board members, you have access to our next exclusive session where we'll keep the conversation going with these panelists. And for our other supporters and viewers, we'll see you at about 3.30 p.m. Pacific time for our session on China's economic policies. So with that, I look forward to seeing you either very, very soon or very soon. And thanks again, everyone, so much.